Hello, greetings to you all, and welcome to Model 5 of our online course on migration policy, free movement, and regional integration within the context of COVID-19, and then the African free trade area. So this model is on migration and human rights. As we note so far in this discussion, know that migrants have been the, among the group of people who are vulnerable and issues of human rights is very important in this discussion. So we take a quote from the former president of South Africa, the late Nelson Mandela, in one of his speeches to the United Nations, made this profound statement that depriving people of their fundamental rights is to contest their very humanity. So this is very important because human rights, it's very profound in the life of every human being. It is, it is what makes the person a human being. So it is very important. It's not something that can be taken away from it's part of the person. So no matter the state of the person, its rights are very important. So in when we are defining human rights, there are very key issues or key themes that we are interested in. And human rights has to do with the, the right that every human being possesses or is, possesses and is able to exercise. And so just having the right and not able to exercise is not enough. Then by virtue of this, the person being a human. And this right cannot be taken away or deprived of the person under any circumstance, whether it is on sex, religion, language, nationality, the social status of the person's society, the cultural background, under no circumstance under this earth should someone be deprived of his human rights. Because as is stated, it is inalienable. It is very fundamental and embedded in the person by virtue of the fact that the person is human. So the foundations of these rights, most of the time, are sought in the liberal notions of constitutional civil rights protection. And it also protect the person against the state in which the person finds himself. And then the state is also the entity that's supposed to guarantee the enjoyment of these rights. So most of the time, the state is in between. The body that is supposed to protect you is the same body that is also capable of depriving you of these rights. So it is important that we have constitutional and civil rights um, protection provisions that ensure that the state is not able to take this right away. And then the state is also empowered to ensure that if, if it, it does not take the, this uh, right away, but any other person, any other body is also not able to deprive the person of these rights. And the state does this by implementing some laws and provision that ensure that human rights are guaranteed at all levels. There are also legal protections of human rights, and which presupposes and implies that the existence of state as the source and the and authority for normative framework and the production of rules and mechanisms for the implementation of human rights based on international treaties that exist between states. So aside the national laws that the state is supposed to implement. There are also international treaties that the state has ascended to and is sometimes obligated or bound to implement them to ensure that the rights of people within its jurisdiction are protected. So this is where issues of migrants also come in. So the migrants find themselves in the jurisdiction which they may be nationals, they may not be nationals, still need to be enjoyed, uh, need to be accorded these rights, because it's something that they are entitled to. So each right does the power to demand 
and each freedom. So the power to act, we have the right to demand for certain privileges. And then the, also the, the freedom to act be able to do certain things are all determined the five types of relationships in every society. So first we can talk of several relationships, which has to do with the legal recognition of someone as a citizen. And so by virtue of you being a citizen of the state, you are entitled to the protection of the state in which you are a citizen. So that is why the UN and the AU are making efforts to ensure that people who are stateless are accorded some citizenship, either in the, their countries of destination or any other country that is willing to accord them citizenship. Because without citizenship, you are vulnerable to abuse of your rights. But, but if you are a member of a state, a sovereign state, the state has an obligation to protect you and ensure that your rights are not trampled upon. And there's also the political relationship that has to do with active participation in state activities, state political activities. So in this case, you also have the right to participate in the running or the daily activities that ensure the running of the state. So you can assume certain positions, contributing to decision making, you are able to vote and decide on the choice of leadership. So these are all rights that you are called by virtue of your political relationship with the state that you find yourself. And there's also the economic relationship that has to do with reciprocity and exchange. In this case, it has to do with uh, source of livelihood. So the state is also able, is, the state has an obligation to create the conducive environment that you're able to operate economically, you're able to set up businesses, or you're able to gain employment, or you're able to venture into any economic activity that will earn you livelihood. And in that area, too, you are also given the opportunity to also contribute to the socioeconomic development of the country that you find yourself. There's also the social relationship. So the state is supposed to provide the environment, there's needed structures, Sure that there is peace and democracy, laws, rule of laws, work, so that you're able to fit into the society very well. You don't have to become a misfit, but able to fit and operate very well within that society. Then there's also the cultural relationship of belonging, which is also tied to the integration. By virtue of you being recognized as a member of a community, a society, or a country, you are entitled to certain rights that are able to enjoy and feel that you also belong into such communities. So considering all these rights, so if anyone moves, whether voluntary or involuntary, crossing uh, international borders to reside in another um, jurisdiction or a country, whether temporarily or permanently, in the country that he or she is not uh, a member or by birth or by any form of uh, citizen, you are not a citizen of that country. Such a person also comes to some uh, a form of double interaction that the person has. So first of all, there is, the person has an interaction with the state, and with the individual has an interaction with the state in which finds that the state of destination, the country of destination, and then with the people who reside in that country, the destination country. So first of all, the person is within that jurisdiction, the person is entitled to protection of his right. His right is not supposed to be trampled on. So by virtue of being within that jurisdiction, the authority of that country has an obligation to protect the person, whether the person is regular or irregular migrant. Because International human rights law ensure that people's rights are protected no matter the space in which they find themselves and then the, the circumstances or the status in which they find themselves. And then with the people. So the people that is living, the people are also, they are 
they are, they are, they are also their right or their responsibility to ensure that the person is accepted, the migrant is accepted, and live with them in peace. I have also obeying the laws and regulations in that country. So international borders are the razor, the razor wire for which the modern issue of war, peace, life, and death for nations are suspended. So by virtue of the person crossing the national border, these issues are supposed to be ensured. The person is entitled, whether there is war or peace, there is death or life, the person is, uh, rights are supposed to remain intact. The person is entitled to protection. So when we consider our current movement, patterns of migration, uh, that current migration phenomenon on the continent is likely dominated by people seeking employment. So that's why we're looking at um, um, international migration statistics. Uh, that most migrants are motivated by economic reasons. So that's we have economic migrants, people seeking better livelihood, seeking work opportunities. And aside with this search of um, group of migrants, there are also people also moving to ensure that they also have safety, peace, and stability because of the constant wars and then the disaster that are leaving certain parts of the world. These are factors that are also causing people to move. So you have people moving for employment, others also moving for peace and stability. So in all this, we also know that um, labor migrants are very important. They are very crucial to the economy of every country, be it a destination or an origin country. In destination countries, they fill the labor gaps and the skill gaps as well. Because most countries, especially the developing countries, need labor. And then the, in the developed countries, they need labor. And then developing countries, they have excess labor, also need employment. So migration is a phenomenon that tries to balance um, this situation. And then also providing essential skills for countries that need them. Aside this, they also balance the social structure in terms of the population of countries by diversifying them, whether ethnically, culturally, or religiously. So we have people moving in this area. And another um, aspect of our migration pattern is that migration is becoming more feminized. Hitherto, migration was tend to be dominated by men, but now the statistics is almost balancing. If you look at the global migration statistics, we have more women who are almost the same number as men who are migrating because of the creation of domestic employment avenues for women to also migrate and fill set gaps. But so we can talk of the case of the Middle East, the Gulf countries, that um, we have more of um, African migrants, especially in West Africa, we have more of the females migrating more. Well, well, okay, it's more common in West and Eastern Africa, migrating to these countries to ensure uh, to gain employment. And all these patterns also come with associated rights abuse. Also, the women that we are talking about work in the domestic space. And in most countries, the domestic space is the least regulated aspect of the national uh, labor area because it is more of a clandestine area, whatever pertains in somebody's house is hidden. So more treatment rights abuse go on without the knowledge of uh, the right authorities. Some authorities make efforts to send supervisors, but supervisors also have challenges with them and they are unable to ensure that the rights of people in this space are protected. So the Middle East, for instance, they have a, a general agreement called the Katefi uh, practice, which is not a law, but something a norm that has been agreed by them. So the moment the migrants um, gets into the employer's house, the certificates and other relevant documents are confiscated because they sponsor the migrants' journey. And it is the agreement is that we work pay 
for the amount of money spent on you before you can leave. And because of this right abuse, people are forced to move. So when the documents are confiscated, you are unable to move. So all these are right abuses that need to be tended to. And then there are also people who are also moving as a result of severe political crisis, civil wars, fight against terrorism, and other. also pushing people across um, national borders. So they, 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 they also, as they are also moving, there are some who have also been restricted from moving. And all this raises issues of violation of their basic rights. So all this are there. We have rights that regulate them. But the challenge is that there is no um, a single binding international framework that regulates or manage international migration. So this single framework is not there. But in the absence of such a framework, we have other international, regional, or bilateral agreements that step in to manage specific aspects of international migration to ensure that rights of migrants are not abused. So with regards to migration, more specifically, international and regional human rights laws are available. These laws have established some legal minimum um, regulation to help develop in the development of uh, national legislations and then policies that are put in place to ensure that the rights and dignity of the life of migrants are respected. So with reference to some of these um, international and regional human rights frameworks, we can talk of nine treaties that have been adopted within the context of the United Nations, that is, which is a supranational body that most um, countries that are subscribed to these regulations abide by, and they also ensure that their domestic laws are in harmony with these laws, ensure that people within their jurisdiction, their rights are protected. So we can talk of these laws, regulations, these are all there to protect the rights of migrants. I also talk of the right of, it's also deal with specific aspect of migration and that specific group of people, uh, migrants. So women who are the most vulnerable are also protected. So the women's rights protocol in Africa is a very key framework that is there to protect the rights of migrant women. And then people with disability. Migrants with disability are also very vulnerable and need a lot of protection. The elderly, um, migrants who are elderly also need protection because they find themselves in situations where now they cannot work and they need the protection of the state in which they are in. There are issues of their pension. In Africa, um, in terms of our regional and um, integration approach, issues of portability of um, social security benefits have been top of the agenda. My, um, migrants who have retired, they are old, they want to return to their countries of origin, and they want to be able to go with their social security benefits, but we don't have mechanisms to ensure that they are able to enjoy their, their, their benefits in their country of origin. So some are forced to stay in the country of destination because that is where they can enjoy their benefits. Moving to the destination, they may not have any source of livelihood. And these are all issues of human rights. These are issues of migrant rights that need to be and then, so that's also the protocol on the free movement, the name of all these uh, regulations that are there to ensure that migrants rights are protected. In the area of labor law, the International Labor Organization Constitution and its conventions are also there to ensure that the right of labor migrants are protected. And so in terms of um, joining labor unions, fighting for better working conditions, we should have a bargaining power. These are rights that they are entitled to, even though they are migrants. 
you need to enjoy all this. The refugee convention and then the refugee sector is also there to ensure that their rights are protected. At the regional level, at the African level, the AU Convention of Refugees in Africa is also there to protect. In the area of international crime, also have the Convention on Transnational Organized Crime to also ensure that these activities do not undermine the right of migrant workers. So there are protocols to also prevent and suppress some international organized crimes like smuggling and trafficking, which most of the victims are women and children. So the root cause are there to ensure that migrants are protected, whether they are being trafficked or smuggled by sea, by land, or by air. Then in the area of international humanitarian law, there is the Geneva Convention and its additional protocols that are also there to ensure that at the international level, rights are protected. So if someone's right is being trampled upon and within the country, the person is not able to seek protection or justice, can appeal to any of the agencies of the UN agency on the international humanitarian law for redress. Then in the area of um, consular law, which also regulates how sovereign states interact with each other. So there's the Vienna Convention on Consular Relations, which solely deals with international relations between two. So the regulations that are there to ensure that countries put in the necessary legal structures, which are the rights of individuals within the country are protected. So whether countries of origin, countries of destination, is supposed to ensure that rights are protected. So if one country feels that its nationals in another country, this right is being trampled upon, the rights are being abused, these conventions can be applied to ensure that justice is sought for the people involved. And then the you know, international um, law can also cite the convention on the safety, the life at sea. So these are international conventions that member states that have assented to this to ensure that they apply them. So typical examples can be made of countries like Italy, Malta, Spain, which ensure that um, African migrants who migrate on the Mediterranean do not perish at sea. And they invest a lot. It's not because they just want to save life. It is an international law that they are bound by that they need to respect. They need to respect the life of people at sea. So they ensure that they go on the sea, rescue the people, keep them in camps, and then they send them back to their country. They don't need them all right, but they don't have, they, they are not allowed to let the lives of the people perish at sea because of some of these conventions. That because if they allow, they allow the people, they are contravening these conventions, and this may be held against them as a country. So convention on then search and rescue on high seas, these are all clause that ensure that migrants' rights are protected. And then in terms of the enjoyment of rights of migrants, there are some general principles. So the principle of non-discrimination, very important. So as you stated earlier, earlier, under no circumstance should someone be discriminated, either on race, gender, ethnicity, culture, economic status. There shouldn't be any form of discrimination. So, and since there is no, form, no discrimination, there should also be what? Equality in the distribution of rights, ensure that people enjoy their rights equally. And then respect for human dignity, for the rights of the people are protected. So if these general principles are available, they try to control the abuse of their fundamental human rights. Then there are also some specific principles are based on legal categories of migrants. So there are some principles that deal with children, refugees, and then workers. 
as I stated earlier, most migrants are economic workers, uh, economic migrants, so they migrate as a result of work. And those who are also forced by circumstances to move and become refugees. So there are some laws that also deal with this category of people. So that the principles of the, these laws also are there, those on children to seek the best interest of the child. So no matter the situation that the child is found in, the law uh, obligates the country to show that whatever decision they take should be in the best interest of the child. So they, and this principle also ensure that they, so they help the child to develop, providing them with the needed health care, education. So these are fundamental rights that every child is entitled to. Then when it comes to issues of refugees, there's also the principle of non reformat which is going to ensure that countries are not obligated to return any migrant to the country of origin. So if they find themselves in your country, whether they enter legally or illegally, you are supposed to provide them protection. Do not send them back. For that, there are circumstances that is pushing them away. They may be tortured, they may be killed, they may be violated in several ways. So countries are obligated not to retain them and keep them in their country and protect them. Then when it comes to migrant workers, there's also the principle of equality of opportunity and treatment at work. So as long as the person is employed in the country, is entitled to the labor um, rights and protection as citizens also enjoy. So there shouldn't be any discrimination there because the person is a migrant or an irregular migrant. So in terms of the enjoyment of rights, we also have the freedom of movement, especially in the regional integration approaches that we have. We can cite the common ones that we have in Africa, ECOWAS, the Economic Community of East Africa, SADEC, IGAD, the Central African, um, we also have their association. So these, all these um, regional bodies are trying to prioritize free movement to ensure the integration. So a member, so a member country become a um, regional citizen and they can have access to any country within the region in which they find themselves. So, and there are articles also that regulate this movement. So in terms of the African Charter, Article 12, Section 2 of the African Charter, Article 8, of, also of all this ensure that migrants' rights are protected under the free movement protocol of free movement of persons. However, in all this room, there are also exceptions. So states have some power. Sovereign, that's why they are sovereign. So they have some power to also limit this movement. So the states are also, they also are entitled to refuse to authorize access or restrict access to some people to have access to their, national, their territory to enter. So and some of them could be based on their own national policy. It could be based on health grounds. It could be based on, on security reasons. So if states find that the entry of some group of people or an individual who pose a health risk, a security risk, or it is against their national policy, they also have the right to, pre to prevent the person from entering, even though the person is entitled to free movement of persons. And then the agreement states that if the person, if the state decides not to grant um, admission into each territory to an individual based on these grounds, it reports to the sending country that on these grounds we are refusing entry to this group of people. That is international law, international agreement. So states also have the right to expel non-citizens. So irregular migrants, that is why we have, especially in the developed countries, they go around arresting illegal migrants, keep them in 
repatriation camps, and then repatriate them into their countries. So there's no security of their rights. And even though the migrants have the rights of movement, there are also some limitations. And so the amendment of international human, law, uh, human rights law, the uh, law of non reformer of refugees, the situation of persons liable to be tortured, prohibition of political. So these are all the among all this also ensure that in course of not allowing them to access your territory or expelling them, they still have their rights. There are also laws that are there to protect them from torture, from any arbitrary expulsion. So before they are repatriated, there are a lot of investigation that go on to ensure that they are really irregular migrants before they are deported. So these are also facilitated by the development of cross-border initiatives and procedures that facilitate broader um, trade and mobility for us. So in terms of labor mobility, there are also some principles that regulate labor mobility and also ensure that rights are protected. Aside the free movement of persons, there's also free movement of workers. And then so they are entitled to some permits or that they pass a free movement. So some documentation needs to be provided to ensure that they are part. And these are based on mutual recognition of some bilateral agreement that countries go in to ensure that these things are done. So as I mentioned earlier, there's also to also facilitate the free movement of labor. There's also the need to talk of the portability of social security benefit transfer of funds so that migrants will be able to remit and ensure that for the, the purpose of their migration, if it's to support family members at home, are also met. So freedom of association and the right of collective negotiation. So this has to do with labor migrants. There are also this charter, the African, Article 10 of the African Charter. And uh, these are all um, legal framework that also ensure that migrant workers who find in certain countries of destination are entitled to freedom of association to join labor union. They have the right to engage in collective bargaining to ensure that there is improvement in, 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 in the work that they do, their conditions of service. So they are right from a joint and um, trade union. So, so then prohibition of slavery and then cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. These are all. Um, legal framework that exists to ensure that they deal with this specific aspect of migrants. So if we are considering the African Charter, these are all um, articles that deal with issues of fiscal integrity of the person, slavery and other security, fair trial, they are defining themselves against the law, they are entitled to fair trial. Then we're also considering the protocol on the rights of women in Africa. So there are um, parts of this protocol article that deal with their dignity, their integrity and security, and ensure that they are not they don't find they in any harmful practice, and that is a protection from armed conflicts. So that is why when there's conflict in any country, women and children are not supposed to be hurt as a general rule. So that's why you see them, the men fighting, but the women are clean based on this. And these protocols are relevant, even in times of war, if you break them, there are issues. If you also consider the Children's Bill of Rights, so there are also certain aspects of it that they will child labor, abuse and ill treatment, negative social and cultural practices, armed conflict, sexual exploitation, sale trafficking, kidnapping, and begging. So these are all laws that are there to 
and then the cultural issues are also very important in our norms and beliefs. That is why, especially in Africa, child labor in the area of um, agriculture, such as cocoa farming, is very rampant. But there are also cultural issues. There are this argument that children don't engage in child labor, but they engage in work, which is a normal way of socializing them. So the law in its application also need to consider the social cultural practices within the jurisdiction that this thing happens. So all this provision are there to ensure that they protect vulnerable um, migrant categories. So we can also talk of the convention that seeks to abolish forced labor. And this is so. But even though these are there, there are also exceptions. So in terms of times that you are supposed to perform some compulsory military service, maybe your rights can be considered, it may not be considered as violation of um, rights. Work resulting from judicial conviction. So if you go against the law and you are convicted and you are given some sentence, do some work, your rights are suspended. So service that are required in the areas of course, major services that you're also supposed to own. So some civic responsibilities. So some rights are there in the interest of the state. So right to an effective remedy. So these are all rights that are there to protect um, the migrants from abuse from their rights. So we can talk of economic and social cultural rights of migrants in the African Charter. These are all rights that they to ensure that they can move in Africa today. So under the UN bodies, the eight main UN bodies, so that also protects the right of migrants. So this, those which are also in the right up there to ensure that migrants are protected. So in terms of, there are also issues of institutional um, protection. So institutions also have some obligations to protect. So there are some architecture that is followed to ensure that rights are protected. So at the international level, there are some modalities that are obeyed. And these are laws including specific countries in Africa that these laws are applied to ensure that rights are protected. So in terms of consideration of um, periodic reports, so the report are communication complaint, an institution that receive complaints of violation of human rights. And this can be done, individuals can report their own way. Mechanisms are put in place for the individual to be able to report. This could also include, even it has to do with disputes between individuals and states or between states, yeah, there's legal frameworks that deal with them. And there's the need to do some confidential inquiries in terms of rights violation. We also have some specific um, legal frameworks that deal with all these issues. In terms of protection of labor, migrant workers, the ILO's working protect, uh, protect, worker protection system is also there. So they, they also have regular monitoring of the application of their labor standards. So there are committees that constitute experts in certain areas that apply this in terms of labor agitations agitation for better working conditions or services. They are all there to ensure that rights are protected. So the constitution of the various committees are also stated then where we can find them. So in terms of bargaining in every state, we have the 
tripartite commission, which involved the government, the employer, and then the labor unions. So these are the people who meet and agree for conditions of service on behalf of migrants. They are also there to ensure that nobody is searched or the rights is abused. However, there, also, there may also be special procedures where individuals can lodge specific complaints which can be dealt with. So at the ILO level, they have commissions and then the various bodies that constitute these bodies. At the continental level, the AU Commission on Human and People Rights. So there. So we also have the, it could be also judicial or crazy judicial mechanism where you may not, the question is where you may not necessarily need to go to a well-established court to seek redress, but committee also be set up, which will operate within the confines of the legal system to ensure that the arbitrate on any of these issues. Sure. So in Africa, we have the African Commission on Human Rights, which is headquartered in Banjo, Gambia, it's created, created, created by the African Charter and composed of 11 independent experts who are responsible for promoting and ensuring the rights of human rights. And this man also include migrants. So as long as they find themselves within these jurisdictions, they are entitled to protection. And also examines that every three years, the periodic report of states so the states are supposed to also provide reports on human rights issues. So this committee sits to find out the issues of right abuse in the state and then things that they issue the areas that they need to address. And all this are effort to ensure rights are protected. So one of the eight mechanisms, especially in terms of the architecture for protection of human rights in Africa, one of its mechanisms has been specifically dedicated since 20, um, to, to 2004 to refugees, asylum seekers, internally displaced persons, and migrants. As you know, they are the people who rights are more liable. So we also have the African Committee of Experts on the Rights and Welfare of Children. So this is also headquarters in Lesotho and also under the AU Charter, which, um, so the heads of African governments control the operations of this committee or the report to this committee and among others, it is supposed to examine, be examined every three years by the African heads of states. What that they do with regards to the rights of the child. It also examines individual activities as well. And then some of them, Seeking legal redress, we also have the African Court on Human and People's Rights, which is also created to complement and strengthen the mission of the AU Community Commission on Human Rights. It's also made up of independent judges who also deal with issues of human rights. So the African um, Human Rights Court. It's based in Tanzania and so seek for protection of migrants. So in practice, the commission and the court have agreed to bring before the court through the commission of appeal against states which have ratified the protocol without making any declaration. So courts also issue 
that at the request of states, the African Commission and the organization recognized by the African Union, the advice of opinions on the application of relevant provisions of the African Charter. So aside this, within the architecture, we also have political organization. So political organization that also have the responsibility of ensuring that rights are protected. And these are all, these are the headquarters of the African Union. So these are different units within the African Union structure that are also working. And among them, we can talk of the Department of Political Affairs, Peace and Security. There's also the Department of Health, Humanitarian Affairs and then Social Development. Yes several others, but when it comes to do with issues of um, migrants, asylum seekers and refugees, these are the relevant departments that deal with their human rights issues. And then at the sub-regional level, at the ECOWAS level, we can also talk of the ECOWAS courts. Uh, so the East African um, community also has its um, port, which all perform similar functions or to ensure that within the region, the rights of people with the migrants are protected. So the Court of Justice of the East African community is also there to be based in Tanzania. And then at the national level, we also have the National Institution for Human Rights. So in most countries, there are also certain bodies that are there to ensure that rights of people are protected. And most of these bodies tend to be independent of government because member government is a body that can also abuse the rights of people. So even though the government is supposed to champion the protection of human rights. It's also possible that it can also be on the wrong side of human rights abuse. So for example, in Ghana, we have the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice, which is a national institution for human rights. It used to be the Office of the Ombudsman, but it's an independent body that is not subject to the influence of the government. Even though it is funded by government, the head of the institution is chosen by government, but in its activities and operations, government is not supposed to interfere. They are, they are supposed to comp compile and complaints of right abuse, which could be against other individuals, could be against the government. And there are some of these bodies that can actually go to court and prosecute offenders. Others cannot, they don't have their prosecutory powers, but can rely on the service of the judiciary to ensure that these are protected, these are carried out. So, aside this nature, we also have the courts and tribunals. In almost every country has courts and tribunals. They are the, they are the guarantors and they are the, to ensure that there is respect for human rights in Africa. They are also supposed to be there are bodies that are supposed to be independent, but most of the time their independence is also um, questionable. Uh, because they sometimes they allow issues of human rights and news, requiring events of xenophobia in certain parts of the country are supposed to be checked by these courts. But there are constant occurrence and issues that there some doubts that it is of this. Okay, so this is the end of the model. Thank you very much for being part of this. All the best, and I hope you finish all the assessments and ensure that the education process is smoothly carried out. Thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye.